Well, today, first of all, welcome. Today we are going to be covering a subject that when Jane said, what are you preaching on? Which she asks every Sunday, and I try not to mm-hmm. leak it out too much. But she asked, and I told her, and she said, oh boy. Oh. <laughs> We're going to go into James 3. We're going to talk about the tongue a little bit today. And how uh, challenging it is for all of us to harness that, to control it. So if you would, let's just go to the Lord in prayer as we begin here. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this beautiful mild weather that we're having. What a blessing that is. I thank you for those that are gathered here today. Lord, I ask your protection on those that are not on this holiday weekend. I know there's a lot of people traveling and and visiting family and friends and getting a chance to spend some time in fellowship with them, Lord. And I just pray that this morning, for those that are away from us, Lord, that you reach out and touch them, that you're your hand reaches down and they feel your presence, Lord. As we get into the Word, Lord, I just pray that you uh, open our hearts and open our ears. Give me the words that you want spoken, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. There was a woman that Winston Churchill always had a problem with. Her name was Lady Astor. And they were famous for back and forth, biting back and forth. At one point she said, if I was your wife, I'd put arsenic in your tea. And he looked at her without skipping a beat and said, Madam, if I was your husband, I'd drink it. (laughs) Now that is definitely not a controlled tongue there. That is, uh, that's kind of contrary to what we're talking about in James here. So if you you go with me to uh, James 3, we'll get in and start talking about uh, the concept of the wild horse. Our tongue being a wild horse. Starting in uh, verse 1, I'm going to read 1 through 8 here first. James 3, 1 through 8. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Okay, first of all, that that first sentence um, is a little daunting for me. It says, you know that we, we who teach will be judged more strictly. But then he says, if anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man. Well, that's, I think that's a little tongue-in-cheek, too, because there is no perfect man except Christ. So he says, yeah, if you got it all under control, you're good. But then he goes on, starting in verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great for- that a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also is a fire, a, word of, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it is itself set on fire by hell. That's pretty strong stuff. He, he gives three different references there. Um, I'm going to come back to the first one, which is the horses. The second one, he talks about boats and rudders. If you've ever seen the giant tankers, that they, like oil tankers that take across the ocean, those ships are ridiculously large. But the rudder that steers them is actually fairly small. In comparison, especially, there's not much to it. But it's enough to turn the ship in the water. He also references fire and how just a single spark can start a huge fire. And we've had a lot of fires this year in the United States and a lot of fires out in uh, California and the Southwest and places like that. And we've seen fires in Spearfish and um, Crow Peak got burned this year. They got, it was bad enough that they couldn't um, put it out. They had to, it was too rough country. They just let the whole Crow Peak burned, top to bottom. And the evidence of that fire is going to last a long time. It leaves a lot of scars and it can be something as simple as uh, someone throwing a cigarette on the ground. That's all it takes. Somebody being careless with just a little bit of fire can burn it all up. Well, let's continue here just a little bit on in James 3. We'll go through 9 through 12. Starting in verse 9, it says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Again, he uses some pretty strong analogies here. Fresh water and salt water. 
Well, fresh water and salt, there's a big difference between fresh water and salt water. One, salt water is not potable to the body. We cannot drink salt water without being sick. It's not possible. Fresh water is what we all seek. Right now, uh, huge protests going on in North Dakota about water. Uh, it's been said several times, I've read it in the last few years, that the next world war will be over water. Water rights, people having access to fresh water. It's that important. It's that important to us. Um, as farmers and ranchers, you know how important it is to get rain, which we don't have right now. It's dry. Water is an important thing. But if it rains salt water, it wouldn't do us any good. That would just kill everything off. So, in James's reference here, he's talking about the comparison between the two, and he uses the analogy that the tongue praises God and curses men. How can that be? How can we use our mouth one way and expect to be able to act to worth to be worthy of praising God if we're using our tongue for evil when we're not talking to God? There's a big problem there, praising and cursing. Hurtful words can last a lifetime. Um, it's probably not the only source, but some of you probably remember the Carpenters singing group, brother and sister. Karen Carpenter died from anorexia. Early in their career, um, someone referred to her as the chubby sister. And she ended up dying from anorexia. Years and years and years she struggled until she died from it. One little hurtful word can go a long way. Jesus even refers to the tongue as being as bad as, it, as anything else. He says, you may not murder, but if you call your brother a fool, it's the same thing. The tongue can be that powerful. And it, Jesus recognized that that was the case. So what do we do about that? Well, when we talk about hurtful words, we can talk about gossip. Everything coming out of our mouth has a lot of power to it. And that tongue is terrible. The strongest muscle in your body is your tongue. It's stronger than any other muscle in your body. It's not the largest, but it's the strongest. And the whole body can be turned evil by the tongue, is what it said, was what it said here in James. So what do we do about it? You know, when kids are little, what do we tell them? What's that little saying? Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I'm sorry. That's a bunch of bunk. That's not true. You can heal a bone a lot faster than you can heal hurtful words. Somebody could say something to you that hurts, and that could last a lifetime. And that broken bone could be healed a lot sooner than that. So how do we deal with this as Christians? How do we deal with the tongue? Well, the first thing we have to realize is that as we mature as Christians, our training should make us better at dealing with our own tongues. If you are a parent, there have been times when your children have said things out of the blue, in innocence, as children will, that just will make you turn red, you get so embarrassed. Kids are just blatant. They'll just, they'll spit something out in public and you go, oh, oh I can't believe they said that. It happens a lot. We've we've had uh, that experience with Hawkins. Not that Hawkins the one that said it, but some little one will come up and say, "What's wrong with him?" And the parents are like, "Oh, we don't mind answering that question. We don't mind talking to the kids about that." But when children say things like that, we immediately want to grab them and pull them back and say, well, "You're not supposed to say it that way. We're supposed to be kind about things. Let's say things differently." As mature Christians, we need to be changing it a little bit. And I want to go back to the beginning here in uh, James 3. Verse 3, he says, When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Horses are huge animals. They're big, big, big animals. From a standard quarter horse weighing between 800 and 1,100 pounds, maybe to 2,500 pound draft horses. I've dealt with them all, and that, that bit is what we use to control them. And it's a simple thing. And yet, in and of itself, it's nothing unless it's used correctly. And I want to just talk a little bit about it, just because it's something I really enjoy and something I like. This is a bit. Now, this is an egg butt snapple bit. And this is probably a starter bit for most horses. 
This is where we first start. Okay? And this bit has two little bars that have a hinge in the middle and the rings on the outside. And the way it works is if you pull back on both, it pinches the tongue. It's that simple. If you pull on one side, it pushes on one side of the tongue, this one on the other side, and then it pinches on both. Well, if you've got a horse that's starting in a snaffle bit, um, that's exactly what it is. It's a start. Most people won't ride in a snaffle bit forever because it's kind of a blunt instrument. It's just kind of, it's one that, the reason they don't have what they call shanks, the long sides on them, is because when we pull on this, we have to put a lot of force to get a clue into that horse. It takes a lot of force to pull on that. You gotta be strong to be using snaffle, snaffle bits, especially on colts when you're first starting. But that's a starter bit. And as young Christians, when we are first, when we first accept Christ, this is something we have to keep in mind. This is where we start. It's where we start with our children, isn't it? We hear them say something, we do correction on that, we fix it. We, sometimes we have to pull a little harder on the reins than others. In our own lives, sometimes we got to pull back hard. We say something, and then we have to try and make up for it afterwards. We have a tendency to look for forgiveness more than we do forethought. We don't think ahead. Well, I may have mentioned this before, but one of the things that I've learned through my years working with horses that I, I, I have a strong desire for right now is to have, in the end, a bridle horse. And I'm working with my horse on that right now. And a, and a mature bridle horse will transition from a bozelle to a snaffle, back to a bozelle, and then eventually into what they call a spade bit. And that may take many, many years. Often a spade bit horse doesn't get that spade until they're like 11 years old. And they've been ridden all the way along. And what the rider is trying to do is sensitize that horse to become more and more sensitive. So it takes less and less pressure for control. In the end, I don't have one with me because they're extremely expensive and I haven't had a, I'm not ready for it yet. You end up with a spade bit, looks like this, okay? This looks really severe and people that don't understand it are really afraid of them because it's a very heavy bit. It's got this big, long piece here that goes up in their mouth. Long, long piece in their mouth. Real solid, long shanks here. And the longer this is on a bit, the more leverage you have. An inch here <coughs> changes the poundage when you, when you pull on. And people that don't train bridle horses like that will transfer from a snaffle bit to curb bits. I've seen people that will go to chain bits and gag bits. There's all sorts of crutches out there if you don't want to take the time to train the horse where you can just use it to force it. Um, July, I'm sitting next to Troy at a rodeo here in town and we're watching all the horses and they're coming through and they're roping and watching all the timed events and they have the senior men's breakaway roping. And we mentioned between the two of us something we noticed about the senior men's breakaway roping. The older men are roping. None of them had tie downs on their horses. And a tie down is a is a strap that goes over the nose and ties it down to the chest so the horse can't lift his head up. And horses, if you leave them tie downs long enough, they learn to brace into that tie down and they need it. You can't ride them without it after eventually. But none of these older men had tie downs on their horses. And I think that comes with age and experience and time, and I don't want to have to fight him anymore, so I take the time to train him so he don't have to fight him. But that's kind of the concept of this spade bit as well. As they mature, these horses get into this, and the difference between this bit and the snaffle bit, even though the snaffle is gentler in theory, you'll see there's two little brass ring things right along here called braces, and this big, long bit that goes into their mouth. Well, the concept there is that the horse, when they're ready for it, takes that bit and holds it in their mouth. You could take the head stall off and the bit won't come out because it lays perfectly along the tongue and they grab it and they hold it. They put it where they want it in their mouth. And when they do something like that, it shows a sign of control because that long tongue piece they have to be relaxed at the pole, they have to tip their head down, they have to be very relaxed in that bit, or it hurts. If somebody were to yank on that, you could do a lot of damage. You would tear right in, into the 
the interior of the mouth and hurt that horse. But a true bridle horse, you don't have to. It's called a signal bit. You can just lift the, the reins just a little bit, and that's enough. The horse can feel it, and it doesn't need any more than that. Just the slightest suggestion is enough for it to move. It's like watching ballet. It is gorgeous to watch a good bridle horse work. So as mature Christians, we have to think about the bits that we have in our mouth. As we mature, we should be transitioning from needing more force to hold us back. And as we mature and as we go farther, we should be getting to the point where, you know what? I want the bit. I want the bit in my mouth. I want to hold that bit in my mouth. I want to own it. I want control. I want my own tongue controlled, so I'm going to hold the bit. So how do we do that? How do we mature to the point where we seek control? As I said, as young kids, we don't seek it. It's got to be forced on us. And as we get more mature and more mature in Christ, we should be gathering ourselves, getting that control, getting that balance. Psalm 32.9. Go to that real quick. Psalm 32.9 says, Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by the bit and the bridle, or they will not come to you. Don't be something that needs to be forced. Okay? Don't, don't be forced into what you need to be doing. Do it correctly. As a Christian, we should be going that way. So what do we do? There's three little steps I want to bring up in ways that we can control our tongue. The first one is we need to read the Word. When we meditate on the Word, when we spend time in the Word, our mindset goes to God first. Once we are listening to the man that's in control, and we're sensitive to that, and we're paying attention, it will become easier for us to control the tongue. I look for that when I'm training horses too. When I'm working with a colt, even without a bit in their mouth, I want their ears pointing towards me. If I'm, if I'm working around pen, I'm working a colt around, I want at least one ear turned towards me. That means they're listening, they're paying attention, and they're watching me with their eyes. If the ears don't turn towards me, they're not paying attention. They're distracted. They're looking somewhere else. And I will keep pushing and pushing and pushing until I get their undivided attention. Once I have their undivided attention, then we can learn something because they're paying attention. Teachers in school, same thing. Okay, If they're not paying attention, you're not going to teach them anything. They're not going to get anything unless their focus is there. So when we spend time in the Word, we start to develop that focus. We become more sensitive to it. If you want to hear God speak, you can get into the Word. And the more you're in the Word, the more sensitive you are to God speaking to you. The more you will hear Him when He, when that still small whisper comes out, you'll hear it. If you read Proverbs, something that simple, there are 31. One for every day in a month. If you were just to read Proverbs, one chapter in Proverbs, and one chapter in James, for 31 days you would cover Proverbs, which talks an awful lot about the tongue, an awful lot about self-control, and you'd read James six times. <coughs> that would be a whole we take. Just that little bit. And that would help bring you back into focus, bring you back around to where you can meditate on, on God, and then with that sensitivity... You can learn and continue to grow. Another thing, and this is something that it was funny because it's in the resource room. They have a poster of it in the resource room at the school where I go. And I had to laugh because when I'm going through and researching things, I saw it in other people's sermons, the exact same thing that's in the resource room. And this is a simple little rule, something we can all take and use ourselves every single day. And it's an acronym, which, coming out of the military, I love acronyms. This word means all these different words. Something to remember. Okay. And the, this acronym is THINK. It's as simple as that. Just think. Before we speak, we should be thinking, right? And when we think, the way this acronym is laid out, the T stands for, is it true? The H stands for, is it helpful? The I stands for, is it inspiring? 
The N stands for, is it necessary? And then the K stands for, is it kind? If what's coming out of your mouth doesn't fit one of those things, why is it coming out of your mouth? Okay? If it's not true, we have gossip. If we're speaking about someone and it's not helpful, what we're saying is not going to help the situation, shouldn't probably shouldn't come out of our mouth. Does it inspire someone to do the right thing? Is it a necessary thing to be said? Calvin Coolidge said, I have never suffered or regretted things that I have not said. When I was in high school, we had to have a quote in the yearbook. And everybody had to choose a little saying that went with there. And I chose one not knowing at the time that was actually a quote from Abraham Lincoln. And he said, it is better to be silent and to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> and that's a fact. Half the time, when we open our mouths, we say something to make fools of us. We say things we shouldn't. Twenty years after Abraham Lincoln died, there was enough gossip and rumors going around that he was not actually buried where they said he was buried, that they exhumed the body. Twenty years after he died, they dug him up to pop open the coffin and see if he was really in there. Well, before that happened, they'd taken him and the coffin and toured the country with it so everybody could see him in state. And then they buried him, and 20 years later, the conspiracy theorists, would, it was bad enough they had to dig him up. That was just talking with no reasoning there. The other thing kind of goes along with what Abe Lincoln said there, that we have to take into consideration. James also mentions in James 1. He says we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Sometimes the best, the most mature thing we can do is to talk less. Just simply talk less. The average person will spend, during their lifetime, a minimum of 10 years talking. 10 years of our life spent with our mouths moving. There's an awful lot of potential for harm in 10 years worth of talking. Some people, they say, maybe as much as a fifth of your life, which would be more than 10 years. It's very easy for us to lose control of our tongue. But as maturing Christians, we need to be aware of the power that that has. It's simple for us if we think of it in terms of God. What is the most powerful, powerful name for Jesus? It says it right in the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. In the beginning was the Word. That is a powerful thing. Jesus being called the Word is a powerful, powerful thing. Words are powerful. They hurt, and they heal. They can break someone down, and they can build someone up. Every one of us right now could easily come up with a circumstance or a time in our life when we have said the wrong thing. Oftentimes it's inadvertent. We're not paying attention, we're not focused, we're not thinking, we're not thinking about God, we're not going through that acronym, and we just blurt something out that is hurtful. And some people say, well, that's an innocent comment. Not necessarily. It's not necessarily innocent. It might be an ignorant comment. We may not be in tune with the situation enough to realize how much that's going to hurt someone. In our society today, we have so many things going on where people are preaching that we should be tolerant and we should be accepting and we should be doing all these things. And people get offended by everything that happens. People might take offense to things, and we don't have to worry. I'm not saying that we need to be silent all the time. If there's time, if there's something that comes up that we need to speak about, we need to speak the Word of God to something, we need to, to use the Word of God. That needs to be done. We don't ignore that. But there's a difference between using the Word of Shannon and using the Word of God. 
if I'm confronting something that's wrong, I shouldn't confront it with my thoughts, my opinions, my ideas. I should confront it with God. As a mature Christian, I should be looking to the Word for an answer and come back with, this, this is what the Word of God says about that situation. First of all, that takes me out of the equation, which is a good thing. I don't want to be in that equation. I have stumbled and tripped over the things that I've said in my life often. If I would stop, back up, and before I say anything, look into the Word of God and use the wisdom of the Word, it would solve a lot of the problems that I create. I would have less fires to be putting out. If we speak the truth through the Word, that is maturity. That is our maturity in Christ. I am not one of those people who is very good at memorizing. There are people that are very, very good at memorizing chapter and verse, and they can quote it like that. That's hard for me. I've never been good at it. I just, it's, and I try. I have really tried, and it's hard for me to do that. However, I know what the word is. I just have a hard time getting chapter and verse on it. And I have learned over time, both as a Christian and as a teacher in, in a lot of cases, that my best answer if someone asks me and I don't have that passage is, I'll get back to you on that. My best answer is often, I'll think about that. Let me research that a little bit. Instead of, well, I think, wait a minute, that was my first problem. I think. No, I think doesn't solve that problem. God says, solves that problem. I had someone come to me this last week and was concerned about a situation that had happened in their family. Um, I got a big, long story. I'm not going to go into that about situations that were really bothering her. And it, this has happened years ago, and it hadn't gone away. And she came to me knowing that I stand up here on Sundays and said, what do you think? And I said, well, what I think isn't really all that important. This is what I believe. But let me, give me a little bit of time. And the next day I, could, I came in and I had <coughs> verses written down and I had gathered my thoughts and I had the things that I wanted to say, I took the time to do the research and to write it out. And I was able to give her on a piece of paper those verses. It was not something that was just bothering her, it was bothering her whole family. She could take this home and share it with someone now because it came in chapter and verse. So she could go back and show them. The question was whether or not salvation was secure. Yes, it is. And I was able to bring up the verses for her and show her that exactly that matched her situation. Now that's something that I've had to learn over time. That's not something that is natural for us. Our natural state of being is to be sharp of tongue. There's an old story about a Puritan preacher. And he's up front preaching, and then afterwards, this woman comes up to him and says, your sleeves are way too long on your jacket. When you were preaching, I couldn't focus on anything just because of the sleeves on your jacket. They were driving me crazy. <laughs> and she said, I have a pair of scissors in my purse. Would you let me cut your sleeves? He said, sure. And she cut the sleeves to what she thought the length should be. And he said, you know, I have the same problem. There's something you have that's way too long. Can I... Borrow your scissors? She said, sure. He said, stick your tongue out. <laughs> we have a tendency, our natural state of being is to be coarse and to be rough and to be nasty. The first thought in our head comes through our mouth. We'll say someone doesn't have a filter. There's no filter between their brain and their mouth. If it happens up here, it comes out their mouth. That's not someone you like to spend a lot of time around because eventually you're the target. It's a hard thing to be. Um, I'm known for being a little sarcastic, and I have to control that because I don't want to hurt anybody. Those are the things that are naturally there for us. But the natural man is not what we want to be. We see that often. We say that often. 
We know that we're all sinners. We know that we all fall short of the glory of God. And only through Christ is that changed. So the natural man has no control over his tongue. And only through Christ is that changed. So, again, I I would say three things just to reiterate it here. Number one, read the Word. Know the Word. Be able to use the Word. If we fill our minds and our hearts and our mouths with the Word of God, there is no room for the Word of man. Number two, think before we speak. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? And number three, speak less, listen more. We need to be speaking life to people and not death. I'm going to leave you with the final passage here in the way that our tongue should be used. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Paul says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. That is a direct explanation of what our mouth is intended for. We are meant to praise God and to confess. That is what our mouth is intended for, not to hurt. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this word today. I thank you for the book of James. It is a difficult book sometimes for us to accept simply because it is correction. It is correction from you. It is training. It is guidance. It is a gift for us as Christians to know that we have to mature. We have to be growing, Lord, or we're dying. Our faith has to increase, and as our faith increases, Lord, so should our self-control. Father, we know that our tongues are weapons if used incorrectly. But we also know that if we follow your word, they could be word, we can issue words of life. We can issue your words, the word of God. You sent your son here, Lord, as our salvation. You sent us, you sent him as guidance. You gave us your word, Lord, for this purpose. That we might edify him. That we might glorify him, glorify you. That we may lift each other up not knock each other down. I pray, Lord, that you add to our sensitivity. Help us with our focus. To keep our focus on you, to keep our sensitivity to what we do with others, to keep us facing the right direction, Lord. And if the time has come that we have wronged someone through our words, Lord, Help us to seek forgiveness. To go to that person and say, I spoke out of turn. I used my minds and my thoughts and my words when I should have been using God's (laughs) words. And that was wrong. Healing takes time, Lord. But if we were to take the time ahead before the injury, the prevention is so much better than the cure. Lord, help us to get closer to you. Guide us, instruct us. And keep us under your your hand and under your provision. 